Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. Today we had a very interesting conversation with Daniel Betts and Julian Jalbert from Knickerbocker Group. Danielle guides Knickerbocker Group's strategic and operational practices, including architecture, landscape architecture, and interior design, and how they interrelate to construction services and property management. She has worked in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry for over 25 years in both real estate and uh, development and has a license as a engineer and land use specialist. Danielle thrives on helping employees grow and seek to recognize an individual's unique skills and passion. Julian's past, uh, he grew up in New Hampshire with a self-trained architect and builder as a father. Julian's past professional experience includes high-end restaurant, institutional, higher education, and high-end residential design. His true passion lies in residential design and construction, and he's very excited to be a part of the Knickerbocker Group team. Check them out in the latest design theory uh, in the upcoming issue of Main Home Design. It's pretty interesting. Check it out. Thanks. Have a good listen. Julian Jalbert and Daniel Betts. Welcome yeah. to Architecture, Design, and Photography. Both of you work at Knickerbocker Group. What are your positions at Knickerbocker Group so people can uh, judge you? Sure. Uh, I'm an architect at Knickerbocker Group. And I'm president of Knickerbocker Group. So, Danielle Fine had mentioned that you guys are working on, is it, is it a, it's not prefab. It is, but, technically. Well, it's yeah. not prefab with all the baggage of the 90s of like, oh, you can push prefab house over, but it comes on a truck. And so what are you guys doing? Let's, let's go back to the beginning, I guess, when... Um, I guess yeah. <laughs> uh, a little over, that's right, a little over a year ago, I was thinking back in February of last year, uh, I had my yearly review where I sat down with Danielle and uh, Rick Nelson, another architect who heads up our architecture department, and uh, kind of went over, you know, how I'm doing, you know, like uh, my performance and such. And they also asked, like, what are you passionate about? And I said, oh, well, uh, I like the idea of prefabrication in my thesis uh, study at Northeastern University. I kind of did a deep dive into modular with a brilliant professor, a uh, Harvard grad. Um, and I said, I think we should find some way to take prefabrication in some way, shape or form to Knickerbocker Group because we do beautiful high end construction for, you know, great clients up and down the coast. And, you know, uh, labor has been a serious kind of like uh, issue in the marketplace as far as lack of it, quite honestly, and uh, the ever rising costs of labor. So to prefabricate something can uh, help drive costs down, uh, speed up efficiencies. So something I'm very passionate about. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was sustainability and, uh, you know, climate change being a very real thing that's, you know, continuing to transpire. So um, we talked about, like, is there some way to kind of take your two passions and kind of bring them together in some way, shape or form uh, at Knickerbocker Group? Um, so initially, you know, we were kind of considering panelization, which I'm sure you're familiar with, right? You build walls, roofs, floors on the flat. You can do, you know, much of the finished work, you know, like with, you know, siding sometimes, insulation, et cetera. Uh, and we were initially considering, can we do that for Knickerbocker Group to help again with this lack of labor because we have so much work and you know um, always looking for more help to build stuff, right? Then I think it was back last was it summer, uh, LD 2003 from uh, Janet Mills, the recent bill uh, to help basically with uh, the housing crisis in Maine. Um, I think Danielle was quick to jump on that and say, well, on this is a pretty good opportunity to look at this bill here where. Uh, by July of this year in 2023, um, ordinances across the state from towns to cities will be asked to more scrupulously look at their ordinances to be more accommodating to things like accessory dwelling units and ways to allow for more dense housing in areas where, you know, we have a housing crisis in Maine, quite frankly, we're 25,000 units short for the number of people living here. So we kind of all started to think more about, well, huh, how can we tie prefab to address this housing crisis? Interesting. And if these are small scale structures like accessory dwelling units, could we do that with modular construction, volumetric construction, i.e. build, you know, the vast majority of a house in an indoor facility that cuts down on waste, that cuts down on time. Um, so we're super excited about that. And then, you know, the angle of kind of climate change we were talking about. So, you know, in my uh, a recent book that I read uh, called The New Carbon Architecture, it's a brilliant book about, you know, the climate crisis is obviously a big issue. Uh, energy efficiency is very much a big part of it with our buildings. So that's kind of for the past 15, 20 years been at the forefront of how do we do better? Make our buildings more energy efficient. We have to do that. So uh, a lot of builders, architects, designers, 
have done that by way of making a more airtight home, better insulated home, you know, changing the uh, systems they use to heat and cool their homes. Um, but uh, the reality is that you can solve that problem for energy with just about any material you want, things that are derived from fossil fuels, which are not good for the environment. We were looking at it from a, how can we do this with more renewable materials that are good for the environment, that help to sequester carbon and kind of help combat climate change. And that's what that book, New Carbon Architecture, was about, is that, yes, we have to address the uh, energy issue, but also the materials you specify issue, because if you throw a bad material at the problem, it can often exacerbate the problem. Um, so that's a big thing we've been pushing with this new endeavor as well, is to try to source as many you know, local uh, and renewable materials to help with these builds to kind of, in essence, try to make each one of these small scale structures a carbon sink to help fight climate change. Um, so that's kind of where we are today. And it's, it goes deeper than that, obviously. Uh, you want to talk to our units we're looking into, maybe? Yeah, Yeah, or just to... Do to piggyback off that? Yeah, Sorry, ahead. please. Yeah, uh, that please. was a lot, so go yeah. for it. <laughs> uh, first of all, you're really good at uh, talking in the moment from what you know and what you're projecting. And I, I joke with Danielle, I've been rattling around up here for like a year and a half, so I'm just like <laughs> continually crafting my pitch, yeah. you know what I mean? So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being able to coherently spit all that out. Quickly. <laughs> right. Hey, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um, so what, what is the downside and the reason we haven't, we don't have a booming modular market at this point? So to identify what is your challenge. Sure. Um, I think one of the main reasons is there's unfortunately like a, uh, a bad name behind the world of modular construction where... If you stop the average person on the street and ask them, like, would you consider like buying or you know uh, building a modular home? They go like, Ooh, no. Like if we told any of our clients at Knickerbocker Group, right, right, they'd want the custom home because there's a unfortunate kind of like yeah black mark on the idea of modular. Um, and I think that stems from maybe modular of years old, where we we're talking about this in the car earlier about how uh, you know the modular codes that dictate what you can build. Um, are you know fairly behind the times in Maine in particular as far as No, wait a minute. Are there sorry. different modular yes. codes yes. for a modular building than a home? Correct. Yep. Yeah. And, and they're more lenient as far currently, as what yeah. you so the modular code is, is currently more lenient. Things like energy code is so, back in two thousand eight standards. Yeah, so naturally you get a lesser product because people will build to the cost efficiency right. more so than the quality if they have the opportunity Correct. to price tags as big. Correct, yeah. Okay. And uh and it's interesting because some of what we're encountering is that the you have to hire a third party inspector right. and you have to hire engineers to approve the plans for, the, for modular. For modular. Exactly. Yeah, and um, some of their some of the things they're saying is, oh, no, no, you need to have foam in the roof or, you know, these are the, the standards we've worked with. But right. Julian's having to push back and right. and challenge these. The status quo, so to speak. Yeah. 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 So it isn't easy to do a sustainable, renewable home in modular. Right. You know, right. it's easier to do one that is not as any energy that's, efficient. As yeah, that's simpler. Or, that's yeah. conventional so framing. Go ahead, yeah. If you build a higher quality modular home, it's more difficult than building a cheap one. Yes, for sure. Now, yeah. What specifically are the codes that would say, no, no, you got to build this like a piece of junk rather than? Um, I wouldn't say it's so much a piece of junk, but I mean, there's, there's, I was telling Danielle on the ride uh, down here there, you know, where things like code for a crawl space, right? So we're looking to build our modular homes uh, on either minimal foundations and in some cases where viable, uh, like with no traditional foundation on helical piles, if you're familiar, like screws that go on the ground because concrete's a big offender in the world of climate change. Um, but like crawl space, an example in the code, as I'm like reading the modular code, it says you have to have a ventilated crawl space, i.e. if you have a crawl space in your building, there have to be like holes in the foundation to let air just blow underneath your home so if there's any moisture. moisture. Correct. Which is, and I went to a, um, my colleague Bill, who's also part of our prefab team, and I went to Las Vegas this past uh, February and uh, January, February for International Builder Show. We sat in on uh, a seminar about kind of the latest and greatest science behind crawl spaces. Um, and this woman gave a great presentation about, you know, code says X, we propose Y. What we propose is encapsulate your crawl space, insulate it, make it airtight, and then dehumidify it. Make it part of your thermal envelope. That's a much smarter way to conserve energy and make a better building. Whereas if you have these, you know, vents that are needed per code, you're letting a potential moisture under your building that could be humid air and it could condense on the cold concrete wall and drip and turn to water. So that's one instance of wow, yeah, like the code says one thing, which my gut as an architect and from all the building science research I've done doesn't make sense. Like we shouldn't do this. And it's funny, this uh, woman in the presentation is working with a very uh, well-known in the building science world, uh, PhD, Joel Stebrick of Building Science Corporation. 
they're working together to actually try to rewrite the code to be more in line with like what the latest science shows is the right thing to do. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, another kind of instance is uh, on our modules, you know, we're trying to, uh, we have one design that has a relatively flat roof. It's kind of modern style. And I very much don't want to put foam in that roof where in a lot of cases, spray foam, particularly closed cell spray foam, you can use and it solves a lot of problems, but in the end it's foam and it has embodied energy and carbon emissions, right? Uh, we've worked, we're working with a company out of New York that's uh, big on building science and kind of the latest and greatest uh, building materials. And they've devised a way to use dense pack cellulose, like an open cell insulation. In our case, eventually we're gonna use dense pack wood fiber, which is super exciting, um, which they've proven with building science and their, you know, uh, software that's you know helps understand moisture and dew point and all that that this system would work and won't fail however the code within the code there's nothing that kind of can point us to say this will work even though these very smart kind of building science people can vet this out and show that it works so i'm about to go toe to toe relatively soon with this certified inspector to say we want to do this here's the science this will work code says we sh can't do it like what how can we do this we want to do this because it's better for the environment so stuff like that which is very intriguing. Who's um, responsible for hiring this guy? I think Rick and Danielle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But you can see the burning passion yeah. piece, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there it yeah. is. Clear. That's yeah. freezing yeah. cool. So, uh, have, do you have any models developed yet? Yes. Are they at a point where it's financially viable and it's up and running, or is this still in process? Where, where is it at? Yeah, so we have two models that we uh, have pretty much vetted out. Uh, we have a one bed, one bath, 500 square foot. Uh, kind of modern take, yeah. Now, why did you go with such a small thing? I love it. Sure. Why did you choose that? I'd be interested. Yeah, so the accessory dwelling unit kind of criteria, like, okay. yeah, they use, uh, generally speaking, most ordinances dictate that it can be no bigger than like 800 square feet. It's kind of the max. So if you own a home, big enough piece of land, you could, in essence, put a second single family home, like an ADU, on your property, as long as you meet all the criteria. Again, one of which is a certain size that's no bigger than 800 square feet. Um, but the 500, we felt, was a good enough size to have a full bedroom, right? A good size bedroom, a full bathroom. It has enough space to, you know, basically not sacrifice what otherwise sometimes, you know, tiny homes and things like you see them in the news or wherever. You're like, I get it, but like, I cannot live in that, man. That's yeah. so small. Like you're on top of your wife or, excuse yeah. me, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unit, right. This kind of are put in like a lot. Right. right. Yeah, like you li live in a drawer, but. That's a one night thing. Yeah. Right. Part so, of the challenge is coming up with creative ways to make it live big in the small space. Right, exactly. And, you know, right. trying exactly. to decide what is essential. Even something as simple as having a washer dryer in there. Right. You know, Actual if you're living there year round in Maine, having a space when you walk in the door for storage of boots and coats. And yep. it's small, but you don't want to have small and then feel, not cramped feel and, like yeah. you can't live year round. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's part of the design. It's almost harder to design it small and Make you it know, feel living big, big year round. Yeah. And we have big glass, you know, we've got, uh, we're working with, um, uh, a window company out of there uh, produced in Poland, but it's a German, uh, design window. Uh, the European, they're like super energy efficient. They're like triple glazed. Uh, so we're working with actually a local Portland based, uh, performance building supply. If you know those guys, Steve Constantino, he's awesome. So he's helping us kind of like source these windows kind of from Europe on a boat, come over here. Uh, and they're super energy efficient and we can get super big glass with those too at a very, you know, great performance, which is cool. So like in our bedroom, we have this kind of corner glass condition where we have basically nine feet of glass that go all the way to a corner. So when you're in bed, like all you see is yeah. like nature, mm. which is super cool. Um, similarly in the living room on the opposite side of the build, same thing, a big nine foot thing of glass, then a 12 foot slider do sliding door with two six foot. 500. Yes. Yeah. So it's like 50% glass, the house basically, which is, which is pretty cool. Triple glazed. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like the best window on the market as far as performance. Which is for the ceiling height. Uh, so on the 500, so modular is interesting. So you have to work within parameters that the mass or the, the main DOT oh. provides. Like mm -hmm. you can only be so wide, so tall, so long. Um, so this particular module, this 500 square foot unit is a little under 16 feet wide because 16 feet is like the max. Yeah, yeah. by 34 yeah. feet long, that's, you know, I think you can, you can go up to 60 feet long if you want and kind of still be like, you know, above bar with the DOT. Um, and ceiling height wise, we've been kind of like really playing around with, again, thinking of, you know, minimizing waste and that sort of thing. So we're going to actually have a sloped ceiling. It's cathedral, but like very slightly cathedral because... We have our basically walls framed and then our kind of like low pitched roof sat on top, right? And it just barely hits that kind of maximum height allowable to ship at, which is 13 foot six above the road. So got the trailer to think about and then the you know bottom to top of the module and that's like right where we gotta be as far as heights are. Uh, right, exactly, to be low. But <laughs> yeah. This one's nice because it can be 
you know, all done in the factory That's and the then thing. just picked up and dropped there versus, yeah. you know, the classic two different modules going coming together, the putting them together on yeah, site. And so. if you watched videos of modular deliveries, you know, from what I've seen, not a lot of folks are bringing modules to a site that are like more or less done. Like I've seen folks who do, you know, deliver and they got Tyvek flapping in the wind and, you know, those pieces and then they got a lot of work left to do in the field. The beauty about uh, like an ADU, especially this 500 one particularly is that as Danielle said, it's coming out of our shop with the intent to have the siding on, the windows are in, the roofing is on, everything's inside is done. So like at the end of the day, when they get to the site, pick it up off the trailer, set it on the foundation, anchor it to the foundation, put like one trim board around the bottom to cover up those anchors, hook up, you know, electric, hook up water, have sewer come out. And then within like a week, it's like done. Yeah. Enter so, stairs. Uh, yeah, stairs. Um, and again, the beauty of prefab is, you know, with conventional stick framing, generally speaking, you do the site work, right? You excavate, you clear trees, dig a hole, do the formwork for the foundation, pour the foundation, get that all prepped. And then you can start building a house. With our, with our case, the foundation will be ready the day the house will show up and get set. So there's, you can do, you can literally start building the house in the shop even before the site work starts. You can literally start the day the site work starts and have them exactly time out so that the second the site's ready, the house is ready and can be installed. So you can shave off months, months and months of time. I mean, both Julie and I have kind of a shared history in that um, we both have had have ADUs. ADUs. Yep. And, you know, when my kids were little, we lived in a 430 square, square foot while we were building another house. Yep. And he has one now that he uses to supplement his income stream. So I couldn't live in I my mean, house without it. <laughs> it's one of those yeah. things that I think as we look at this next generation of home buyers, I rent my ADU to two 30 year olds right now. Mm. And their ability to buy a house in this market is really hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of reconvincing people buying a you can live in a 500 square foot house right. you, and you can live well. Right. Um, Especially if you're just an adult or two adults. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's pretty easy. And if right. you look at life planning, it happens when you're young before you have kids. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, so many more people than we anticipated that are um, older. Right. You know, and I met with a woman yesterday and she's in her 70s. And she said, I represent this town of people who have grown here, grown up here, raised their kids here, lived here. I've lost my spouse. I'm alone in a 2,500 square foot house. It's not big, but it's big for me all Too alone. Big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't want to maintain it. It's old. It's rickety, and I don't know, you know, what I'm going to do. And so, she, you know, her and all her friends in the community came to us saying, "Could Knickerbocker help us find land and do a community? Mm -hmm. And if we can move into 500 square feet, modern." energy efficient and it's not going to have a like lot of no, problems low to no maintenance yeah. low, no yeah. to low maintenance yeah. um it not only helps them stay independent and aging well in their house longer then it helps open up a four-bedroom house for the families who mm -hmm. are coming into town right. so right. i mean we're i live in booth bay a little different here in south, south portland, portland but yeah. we i mean we have we have a major housing crisis to the point mm -hmm. where we just can't get workers and so even the restaurants are closed mm -hmm. the restaurants don't have enough staff so last summer it was maybe wednesday to saturday for some restaurants right. and last summer we were in the white mountains over in conway mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. all the restaurants were open on wednesday yeah right saturday sunday right maybe thursday and it's why is, yeah why is this it's yeah. it, it's a spiral of no your economy right yeah right <laughs> right to work right. here at minimum and wage so what are tourists yeah. ultimately going to learn well we're, we're going to go visit you wednesday to saturday and yeah so, right you know you're the economy just, kind of you're, you're shrinking so right. it i think the adu the size the 500 800 is attractive because it can be backyard mm -hmm. you know a solution for this woman i met with yesterday could be put it in your backyard and sell your house or rent it. If right. you sell it with life tenancy, you can live the rest of your life on your own property. Or move into the ADU and get more money. Here. Exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah, move into the ADU, exactly. let a family move into your house, mm -hmm. and we kind of help both mm -hmm. both markets here. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're, you know, Julian's passion, obviously, for prefab and sustainability and architecture is part of it, but then dealing with the main housing crisis when it, when it comes to workers we've hired, we hired an intern. Uh, over the summer and they accept it and then they could never she couldn't find, find a house. Yeah, she couldn't you know, find a place this, to live. <laughs> so it's just, you know, when you have interns that are still college age, you really want them to be there in the company. You yeah. be part of the culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, Zoom, you can always do Zoom. But I think it's just turned into an issue for us as an employer. And yeah, I think it will yeah. it will be bigger, you know. So when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I would live centrally out of my car on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Mm. We surf during the day and then I'd work at a restaurant at night. Yep. The restaurant on the Outer Banks, there's a very, very small year-round population. It's a barrier island yep. outcrop in North Carolina. Oh, yeah, nice. um, and so they'd have to rent a house 
that they could let their workers from away that were just going to be there for the summer like me live in. Mm -hmm. Right. When I started living there, I was in the basement because I was like the dishwasher. Bottom of the totem pole, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had to like clear stuff out, like all this trash out to one side and there's like standing water. In the <laughs> yep. I built my bed up on pillows and the door wouldn't lock or close. Yeah. I put, I put a license plate on the handle. So okay. If someone came in, I had my hammer. And, <laughs> yeah. It was it was that kind of a place in a way, but yeah, they had the same situation where they didn't have the workforce, so they would have to rent a house. Right, and right. And they would give this place, and but they charge you rent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And probably make money out of it in the long run too. But yeah. you, and and right. we we have a lot of employers that have staff housing, but not enough. And uh, we've a couple hotels in town have been sold to employers for seasonal housing. So the worst thing there is again you just lost beds in the right. in the region. So right. we have less, you know, room Tourism, for people to right, visit, right, right. and you know it's just it it isn't working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maine mm -hmm. has. I, I've spent the last three months going out and back across the country, and Maine has a lot to offer. Mm. Oh yeah, it is a really nice place. It's a politically balanced place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, we have yeah. strong left in the cities. We have a strong right in the country. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good. I, yeah. I don't think you should ever have a just strictly one way. Yeah. Single party leaning one way or the other. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, weird. Either way. Right. Right. Um, and we have so much to offer because of that. But if we don't like meet this challenge head on right. and provide a place for youth to be like, oh, I see that place as a good place and I can make it there. Right. I, we, I've interviewed people who've actually moved here in their 20s from California because it's just not viable. Mm -hmm. Right. But if we follow that trend, where are they going to go? How right. are they going to survive? And how are we going to attract talent? Mm -hmm. How are we going to convince people that it's a good place to come live, to raise a family? Mm -hmm. and can't even afford to live there. So right. I'm right. Yeah. Super glad you guys are doing stuff like this. Yeah. Um, now, I'm like, want one. All yes. right. Well, <laughs> so, how, are, how are these things delivered? What are the foundation I need to have to put it on? I'm going to. Like, I actually am interested, but I'm going to play like I'm someone listening. Sure. I'm going to try and figure out, like, what do I got to do to get one of these from you guys? So sure. I've got a, a nice little area where I'm thinking I could put something like this. Uh, what do I need to do for site work? How much can I do myself? How much does code say, nope, a professional has to do it. You can't do it yourself. Sure. Because that, for someone who's considering this, like a do-it-yourself option is really you know, appealing for cost savings. Yep. You know. And uh, I will start by saying a lot of the companies that sell homes, you know, you can go on Instagram and see, oh, mm -hmm. buy this home package yeah, or whatever. I've seen a lot of them. Most yeah. of them sell you the home, but then you have to go source the contractors mm -hmm. who will do the site work, put the foundation into the driveway, right. utility connections, and then afterwards do all the finishing. Right. So right. right now we're approaching this, you know, where we're helping someone truly turnkey full turnkey yeah. so we don't really at this point we're, we don't really have a diy option for mm -hmm. someone who wants We've been to talking about swing it a hammer. Sure. i think we yeah. will in the future yeah. but i think you know it's not dealing with something that's built off site and then setting it i think the the, the success is in the execution mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so i think there's a part of it that we want to hold tight to make sure it's sure. done well right um, and especially at the announcement of the new product yeah right. Right. yeah right, right, right. But I, I long term, I think we would love to be able to, you know, we've been, been talking about um, doing pallets, you know, a, a kit on a kit one day, you know, so that you could send it to a DIYer. Right. My husband and I built our house and I would love that option myself. So, but to, about, out of the gate, we're kind of saying land of linens. We're the only company in Maine that is doing that, that is helping right. people. And we've talked to people that bought a house and then they couldn't find the subcontractors who understood how to finish them. Uh, you know, a panel or mo right. modularized home. So yep. I think that is a, a, a hole in the industry right now that we're kind of glad to be jumping into um, and, and helping people with. So, yeah, yeah, we have a client that we're uh, working with right now to be potentially one of our first builds, which is exciting. And uh, they have an interesting kind of compelling story on how they shopped around with a couple other kind of modular and prefab companies previous to us. And as kind of Danielle mentioned, uh, it's kind of fractured in such a way that there's so many different folks involved to kind of make this dream a reality for them where they work with a design team that helps design the modular home, great. They then hand that off to a modular builder somewhere else in the state. They take those plans and kind of build that. They have to hire their own GC then to take those built modules, bring them to a site and install them. So it's like so many different people that arguably the client will have to kind of like work with and like uh, kind of be on top of. So when we told them like, as Danielle said, like we're true turnkey, like you work with us, like you're talking to us the whole time. And we're literally like making your life hopefully that much easier so that you just, 
you know, we'll get your house in the, the day. We'll hand you the keys and you'll be done. You don't have to like shake, you know, chase down GCs, chase down the site work guy, whatever. We do all that. So that was, you know, compelling for them. So for if sure. you called us today, we would say, you know, do you have land or not? Right. So we have a right. real estate arm. And uh, if you don't have land, we have, <laughs> so we've been buying land and we have, um, you know, our pulse on what land is available. Mm -hmm. um, while the housing market, houses go, still are moving pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I think people are less, land tends to sit a little longer because right. there's so much more involved. And so many people moving here, especially from out of state, have no idea what main building costs are like. You know, so to buy land, you're jumping into that whole thing. So I think we start first with, do you have land or not? And then once you have land, we help people do the, what we call the pre-design, but it's really, what do you need to figure out in order to get a firm price? And then when we get to the firm price, mm -hmm. then we can all decide if we're gonna go forward. So for a lot of people, it's just, it's almost education, but it's also just so unique. Like your property, wherever it is, may not be accessible or it may need to be graded. It may have steep t terrain. For, um, we may need to bring track, utilities yeah. in. We handle everything. It, yeah. So we'll go to the site. We start off, you know, after initial consultation, we'll go to the site and we're looking at all of that. Looking Septic for hazards, capacity, wells, for, hazards. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. we, you know, there's no point in doing a fixed price for a unit if you can't offer people a price for all the other stuff. And that's what people run into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they say, oh, that unit's that. I can afford that. But who the site works so much more than I thought. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. You know. yeah. So once someone kind of makes a decision to move ahead, does the price not actually change? It, because it, yeah. in the building world, the price constantly changes, right. usually about double. Yeah. Right. So to touch on right. that, so we have uh, our base price that we you know have listed on our website for our two different units, which kind of like um, showcases what are our base level finishes, i.e. the most arguably cost effective finishes. Uh, we then offer you know different kind of choices you can make as a consumer for things like siding, things like flooring, countertops, etc. That you could choose to say, oh, I don't want strictly just painted drywall walls. I want some nickel gap on this one wall. That's an upcharge of X dollars. I want you know quartz countertops instead of recycled paper countertops. That's an upcharge of X dollars. So you can as a consumer, and this is what we've been talking about in my dream. This our ultimate sales website will be almost like you're buying a car and that like you're kind of going and picking and choosing the different like upgrades and stuff. Get and to the bottom the line, there's a price. Yeah. Yeah. One. Yeah. 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 And it shows you, yeah. And it shows you what the base price is and how that modulates. So you can then, again, as a consumer, like understand and choose where you want to put a little bit extra money to have the ideal product, right? And uh, lofty goal, we're still trying to calculate the kind of sustainable nerd that I am also wants to have a carbon calculator baked into that too. So that way you understand as you're picking and choosing different materials, it gives you a sense of if I do the hemp wood floor versus the white oak floor, hemp wood's more sustainable because it grows in six months, but oak takes 30 years to grow. I just captured that much more carbon with hemp. So you could have a bottom line to cost, dollar cost, but also like you sequestered X thousand, X thousand, whatever, um, you know, uh, the CO2 you've sequestered is there too. So you can see, <laughs> right, exactly. And, so you can play around with it. We struggle with that because we want it. We're approached to this for a reason to do sustainability, right. sta sustainability and renewable resources. But right, then right. some of them are just, will be more expensive. And we also right. want it to be accessible. Right. So right. do we offer, you know, asphalt roofing because it's a lot more, more cost, cost effective than right. metal. And if we do, we want a calculator. So at least people are aware, you know, what they chose is and they can make an informed decision. Right. 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 A standing seam roof on our house was not that much more than a shingle roof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this was four years ago before mm -hmm. COVID, mm -hmm. and it was a you know pre-rolled roof. Yep. You know, yep. But yep. It's yep. Still standing seam. Sure. Fasteners underneath. Nice. You know, yep. And it it was not it was, it was extremely competitive. With yeah. Mm. yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. 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 So th those are kind of some of the options, but mostly the designs don't change. We're really, right, you know, we have right. architects working on it, like Julian, we have interior designers. So we're trying to really, you know, use our creative expertise to nail the design right. because we don't we don't want to change it after. Right. People ask, that's move what this wall, cost, we say, yeah. sorry, no. That's what raise <laughs> right. costs when people say, oh, construction, you start at this dollar and then you end up in another. It's really the, the changes, you know. Right. You Throughout should be able to, a contractor right. should be able to fix a price right. if the scope is known in the building. Right. doesn't change through the process. Right. Right. Um, now, what about if I interact with you guys for something like this and I say the 500 foot one looks great, but I don't want anything done inside real. Like, right. like eliminate the cabinets, eliminate, I just want a space. Like a shell yeah. package, is basically. That a, is that a conceivable option or is that kind of a monkey? We've been toying with that. Yeah, guess, we right? haven't, you know, out of the gate, we're saying we the, the bang for your buck is getting it all 
you know, done. done in, right, right. Because what we've done is hire skilled craftsmen, craftspeople, yep. and they do it all. You know, so when you go to a job site and you are building a house, you pull in the concrete person or whoever, and you pull in framers, you pull plumbers, in electricians, electricians plumbers, yeah. drywall. And so in the shop, we have these amazing main craftspeople that do sheetrock they do framing electrical they're doing the rough plumbing, plumbing. Yeah. um they're doing they're doing the finish work on the inside so you really i mean it is the most it is a cost-effective approach to doing it because um, yeah the modular uh, modular world the modular industry is fascinating in that you know in the world we live in which is the custom home world arguably some of the more the skilled trades people we work with the plumbers the electricians there's such in such hot demand that their cost is, is super high, right? Like the eighty, ninety, hundred dollar an hour is what they bill, which is because there's not many of them around, right? And everyone needs electricians and plumbers. Uh, in a modular world, you know, as Danielle said, our skilled craftspeople can all do this because that's part of how the modular system works. Is anything within the envelope of the modular build, you don't need a license to do it. You only need a license to ultimately hook it all up. Because you think about it, when you're roughing in plumbing, roughing in wires, nothing's hooked up to be dangerous. It's just kind of like putting pipes and wires in the walls. So you do need a licensed electrician at the end to kind of like hook it up and juice it up to go and the same with the plumbing, but so but that's- Your investment in a licensed individual in that is far more cost effective in where they have to be rather than involved in the entire- Exactly, right. exactly. You can keep your very talented, but maybe not as expensive because they're not licensed people doing a great job. Right. Yep. But you can cost effectively sequester it in the factory. Exactly right. Before it goes out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great way of finding better quality for less cost. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so right now, again, we wouldn't, I don't think we, we aren't offering it. We're just offering it as a finished unit. But, right. you know, you, not with furnishings necessarily. We have furnishings packages for all of them. So, I mean, it, this is like land to linens. We're trying right. to do the whole thing. Right. <laughs> so right. if somebody came in, we could find a piece of land, sell in the house, and it would be filled you with furnishings furnish and yeah. right. silverware and you know, all so that. The, so your target market is essentially ADUs, like right. one and done, like someone yeah. decides I need a, a home office that's essentially a small home yeah. and I have to accept it like that. Uh, eventually you might offer a smaller or maybe less furnished one, but yeah. 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 now the market is right. ADU, it's a complete a house. One bedroom. Tiny, but small. Yeah. Bedroom. A small house, yeah. Yes. For 500, and then there's a bigger one. A as two well. bedroom. Yeah, 800, 800 square, square foot. Yeah, two and bedroom, also, we've house. got some pretty cool sketches of, um, you know, you can pair them. So, in Julian's right. scenario, when right. he bought his, he and his family bought a house here, before you closed on it, mm -hmm. you went to the pl uh, planning board and got right. approval to turn the garage into an, an ADU. ADU yeah. And yeah. so, as an income model, someone could go to a bank and say, I'm going to do an 800 and a 500, or I'm going to do a 500 and eight two 500s right, and right. get a loan for that. But the rental income from one of them could pay off the, the mortgage for both. Right, right. So I think we've done all these sketches looking at sun views, you know, because we still want to be good designers and adapt mm -hmm. these appropriately to the site. So how can we flip them, mirror them, and, you know, take advantage of privacy if you were going to pair two together and maybe do boardwalks with a little sauna right. or something, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But create, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think you could grow. Similarly, if you were a young couple, you could have one and then grow into the two bedroom, you right. know, build right. that later, right. connect it, and then right. use that as an in-law or, or an in income stream. So it's, we're really trying to make it as adaptable as mm. possible. And flexible and as possible. Like yeah. you can grow with your family over time, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've often thought, why don't people start out with a small home that mm -hmm. they have the idea of like, this is the uh, kitchen, living room, bathroom, and single bedroom. And we know that eventually we're going to be adding on to this. And here's the plan how we add on. So it's not like we're right. buying the whole thing yeah. right. when we're just starting out. Like, it's how they used to do it. Right. You know, they right. grow as you have money. Grow right. when, as when you, you have can. family. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. I right. also think with COVID, a lot of people want their own space. Right. You know, and, right. I, I, and at least in Knickerbocker Group's custom market, we certainly saw a trend toward suites. You know, mm -hmm. it's shared baths. You know, people all of a sudden, every, every suite we do has a desk so if someone's kids are here they're going to be Work from working home. from home yep. they're yep. adult kids and so you know the this almost takes that and explodes it so that you have these unique pods then it really could service any size family i think at the end of the day yep. okay so creatively here's a million dollar question mm -hmm. with current interest rates and everything else and the cost of land could i buy two 500 put them on one piece of land and i get to live for free 
That is a mm. great question. That's a great yeah. question. I should know. We will, we will look into that. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. you know, or it's true. It depends, uh, yeah, because yeah. yeah, the rental, I mean, rental, rental market's, market's crazy. for a small home. It's crazy. And I mean, if you yeah. had that, yeah. it, it's absolute no-brainer. Right. Yeah, it oh, is. I can buy land. Build two houses, rent one, and live there for free. Yeah. One pays for it, right. and I'm in for the management side of it. That's what my cost is. Yeah. Yeah. Than pay every, yep. you know. And in Maine, with you know, they, I think the chamber predicted last year, that over the next decade, we're going to need sixty-five to seventy-five thousand houses for Maine w- employers alone. Oh. So you're, if you're young, you're not even sure you're going to be in Maine ten years. It doesn't really matter because the demand is going to be there in ten years. It's going right. to be sixty-five to seventy-five thousand people that need houses right. for working here. So right. it's almost a no-brainer to yeah. do it because it, yeah. even if you don't stay, you ing- you grow up into a bigger home somewhere else. Right. <laughs> you to put can it keep pr- renting it. Perspective. I mean, yeah, I bought a house in South Portland in 2017, as Danielle mentioned converted myself part of the into an ADU. It was like the craziest, most stressful six months of my life. I lost like 20 pounds, whatever. But um, yeah, that now because of the market pays for my house mortgage and then some. I literally have savings accruing because of this small little rental, which is only 427 square feet. It was attached. It was a one, it, well, backstory. It was once a one car garage, simple. And then a previous owner, two owners ago before I bought it, kind of extended it out with a gable, put on a little addition. They kind of tried to make it an apartment and for my, uh, you know, for my professional opinion, it was like poorly laid out, terrible. I ripped it all apart and I found mold, so it was bad. But <laughs> yeah, uh, so um, <laughs> so yeah, I I, uh, I built it, and now again with the market as it is, rental wise, as Danielle said, the rental market's insane in Portland, particularly. I've now rented it to a handful of tenants, and each time I rent it, I get like over a hundred inquiries within like a week of like, I want it. Can I come see it now? I'm like, wow, that's the demand, right? There's yeah, it's also probably a really nice space. And it's, not it's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's nice, it's new, it's fresh, but yeah, so it's unbelievable, right? The market's crazy. Well, Andy rented it to an architect to, coming out of college. That's true. So we got it to It worked for us, yeah. <laughs> was it was perfect. Little, yep, found yep. housing for him. Yep. <laughs> huh. All right, so second million dollar question. Mm-hmm. What is this going to cost me? Sure. Um, well, the, the 500 um, square foot is 200,000. Is our base price. And the 800 yeah. square foot is 300,000. Yep. And then the site work. Is outside different of that. for every site. So that's a home with a custom kitchen, you know, one bedroom. So for the building room. itself, the building here. itself, like pick it up, the building. So set it down. from yeah. the foundation, uh, uh, yeah, above the foundation. Then you have, uh, land cost, right? Yep. Yeah. So then from the the bottom of the house, the foundation into the ground. Right. How much is that usually if you already own? Yeah. It varies, it you does know, vary. whether it's a helical pile foundation or a concrete foundation. Like, uh, plumbing, electric, mm-hmm. septic yeah. on site. Yep. And I'm just, it's just. That's uh, where with an ADU, it's almost, you probably have a septic. Right. It could be public sewer. If it's right. not public sewer, you might need to add right. pretreatment or something to add an additional bedroom to it. Right. So yeah, your, se- your septic, if it's this private septic system, it may not be big enough to support another dwelling unit. Right. Probably my situation. Yeah. Right. You, well, you can add on to the system, or sometimes you can add on a pretreatment system, which is more like a concrete, you know, something easier to do than add on yep. the system. Yep. Um, you know, so I don't know. That might be 15000 or something. Right. You know, so it really right. depends. Those are things we do in pre-design. We go... This is what you're going to need to do that you might to not make have thought work. of. Right, right. Um, but it is certainly the most cost-effective way is if somebody already owns property, they already have a house, and they already have utilities there. Right. They already so have a driveway, yeah, yeah. and you could you really it's about the connections, connections to the utilities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm facing this issue currently. My in-laws are renting, and we'd like them to stay close by. Mm. In-laws, sweet, right? Yeah. To find a place to buy, you're mm. not finding anything livable under three hundred something. And if it's if it's out there, it's junk, right? It's like mm-hmm. old and falling apart, and you got to like gut it to make Especially it decent, like right? Within ten minutes of Bitterford Pool, yeah. Yeah. right? Like a mile inland, and right? You got a ridiculous deal <laughs> on a good amount of land. Nice. That had all these complications, mm-hmm. but now no one that we love can live close to us. Right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. How do we how do we deal with this? So right. this is a great um, opportunity and, and something to consider. I'm definitely pass this on to them see what they think nice it comes in at a price range where it's like oh maybe this is an idea yeah. right and hopefully bitterford can start to work with their codes a little bit mm-hmm. because right. currently if i haven't looked at it in a long time but to my knowledge you have to have enough land for two full houses mm-hmm. to be able to even have a second unit mm-hmm. interesting yeah. mm-hmm. kenny bunkport though you can have uh, 
if you have enough land for a single house, mm -hmm. you can always put in an ADU up to 30% of the size, yeah. the, the main house. Yep. Yep. Yeah, every single town is different, is different so yeah, it's, so is it is really complicated for yeah. Wait till consumers. July. Hopefully by yeah. July when this new bill passes, you know, it'll be more closely examined in Biddeford as to like, should we rethink this? Should we make it easier? Because a lot of municipalities are doing just that, making yeah. it easier because they know there's a problem. We have to solve mm -hmm. it, right? So. A, lot, a lot of our issues initially getting in were with road mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. compliance because there was a whole issue where they had bought and sold and kind of done things out of sequence and it ended up being this weird situation where there's all this land that no one could access hmm. we just kind of took a risk and figured it out hmm. um but now i think if we add any more dwelling units if it's an actual dwelling unit rather than just like an accessory to we have to then uh like improve almost a quarter mile yeah. worth of road oh yeah right. wow through, like a city road right. yeah that's right uh, we ran yeah. into that recently. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is where you're you're savvy in design, and maybe that word a little bit, but a savvy lot of people. Savvy is a strong word. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, a lot of people. That is really the part we need to help with right. the pre-design. Right. You know, because it seems like, oh, I'm going to throw this in my backyard. It's easy, but it is Red never yeah. easy yeah. in these small towns. It's just the right. zoning. Zoning could be five so many pages, hitches, yeah, or it could or be a hundred pages. Hundred pages. Like, Whoa, yeah. yeah. Go far enough inland. It's like, yeah, go ahead. Do yeah, whatever. Right? I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's I just fine. looked at one in Greenwood, and there yeah. was like the ordinance was one page, a couple okay. pages. Build what you want. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so, in delivering these units, our 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 land where we're at and where I would consider putting one, very difficult to get access. Mm -hmm. like what's the put them in place uh, process? Sure. So I guess I think Danielle mentioned it previously. Part of our whole kind of uh, plan as a team is to have kind of like a boots on the ground initial site visit to kind of like have our team walk around and look around to make sure, you know, this could be doable. And if say there are obstructions, things in the way, there's trees, there's ton of rough terrain, we'll put our best creative thinking caps on to try to come up with a solution that can make it viable. If there's some insanely big red flag where we just couldn't foresee, you know, it working, obviously we'll, you know, bring that to your attention. But the idea is that initially we would like go out and just like try to prove it if it works. Um, as far as delivery, yeah, we'll bring them on the back of a, you know, good sized low boy trailer. We have a, a separate crane too that would basically pick it up to move it to put it on its foundation. So I like comes up and there's like a little swampy pond. Sure. Maybe be on the other side of that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Probably a good 30 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Could be doable. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so I need to, I have a shipping container that we built a skate ramp in. Nice. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Mm -hmm. But I need to move that in the barn yeah. and then I need well, if you have yeah, a crane on yeah. site, we can yeah, just pick it up for you <laughs> and move it. <laughs> Why don't just pick that up? Yeah. Uh, well, that that is super interesting. Where can we? Where can people find out more about this? I mean, do you, do you have any actual units built, or is this all rendering? This we we model? have a mini mod. So, mini mini yeah, model. We yeah, did, we did. People can go visit. We went or? to the Maine Green Home and Energy Show last In weekend. In South Portland, last two weekends ago. Yeah. And so we made. Um, it really a home it could be a home office in our art studio it's 160 mm -hmm. square feet it's eight by 20 on a trailer um, and it has a little kitchenette on one end a big room with huge glass doors mm -hmm. um two windows and an existing it, one that's yep, and and it has yep. a bathroom yep. um so you, it would be perfect for an art studio my husband's an artist and he was an he artist wants one. Like, it's oh. got a sink right here big open space big big light yep um yep. and so that one we're probably going to go ahead and offer as an art not as a home but as an art studio or mobile office because mm -hmm. you could you yeah, could right. put that one in, and, <laughs> and it's big enough to fit a murphy bed so you right, could you actually could sleep in there Put a Murphy bed on them. Sketching these for the last oh, couple yeah. Of months. Oh yeah. 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 Kind of thing because we're it, still in design, so send sketches. That's yeah, fine. right. <laughs> you guys can meet my calendar. But see, for me to get anything done if I'm on our property, yeah. never happened. Right. Mm. Because you know, Daddy, look at this. Yeah, yeah. Watch this. Or yeah. sweetie, can you reach this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if I'm down there on the other side of the pond, then I can turn my music up and yeah. lock it. Uh, triple, triple pane windows. There you go. Yeah, you wouldn't hear anything. Yeah, and it'll be very soundproof too. Yep, yep. Yeah. So we this exists, and we did it exactly for the reason you're saying to show people the finishes, and the quality, and of the, the build. and the quality yeah. of the build. Yeah. Because um, I think that's the difference. You know, people can still go out and get a modular anywhere, and probably for and less if you look money. Closely at the details, but this is like, oh, this is a Knickerbocker home. You know, quality, so it's yeah. really well executed. We have a. I mean, it is custom cabinetry. Mm -hmm. um, from a local main manufacturer. Yeah. But it's local materials. So we're, you know, going to um, local lumber yards, do the wood on the inside. Saying, and, a lot, saying it's a Knickerbocker home. 
yeah. right. poems are not they're they're extremely high quality. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Before I go and say like an insulting term. But no, uh, they're like incredible. Yeah. Sure. They are Thank really you. nice. And quality. so this is a product coming from that lineage. Exactly. In a yeah. modular fashion, which is yeah. really appealing. I think the hard sell you're gonna have for people like my in laws is just simply the size. They're yeah. gonna think, Well, right. what about this? What about what about what about well, pay for that. Right. right. And, right. and at the home show it was funny because people said Oh, this seems they big said, enough. How big is this? I mean, 160 square feet. They're like, maybe well, I don't need the 500. Yeah. Oh, it makes a big difference. Yeah. It does. It really does. So, yeah, yeah. and you know, we've had someone that said, "I want to do two 500s with a screen porch between." Yeah. You know, and if you did, if you did three mm. season yep. panels, most of the year you could be out on that porch right. if you oriented it to the sun. So, yep. I think we have a lot of kind of combi combo solutions that will help people with right. overcome the size yep. piece. And we have a website prefabpods.com. Yeah, it, so you, you, and prefab you can, yeah, and you can go to Knickerbocker yeah. group and it's yeah, like it's right there at the right top. Yep. Yeah. They kind of have like floor plans. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, and yeah, then, so we do the 500 has two styles, a modern and a traditional. And then the 800 has two styles as yeah, well. Yeah. And then the We're next. trying to cater to the market because some folks like the modern, some folks want more of like a gable roof with it. Yeah. So. And then each of these, the next step would be to make them ADA. Right. Accessible. Yep. Yeah. we got a current client that likes the idea with this. We've got to have, you know, wheel wheelchair turning radius and bigger doors and a ramp. And so we're going to. Yeah. The senior housing slightly. thing. We, I mean, we have been approached by people from South Thomaston, Damascata and Booth Bay about. Right this kind of senior senior living senior yeah. not quite ready to go to a place that has yeah. you know independent apartments with assisted living but living out their years within a community of other people, similar people it yeah. seems like there's going to be a big market right. with, with that. here's an idea that no one will go for um, <laughs> uh like my parents live in cape arundel cottage preserve i know that yeah uh, yep. now they have a really interesting model it's not a 55 plus community yeah yeah but you can't be there from January 1st to May 1st. Huh. Is, where is that? Is that in? Um, Just right down the road here. I think I worked on that. <laughs> I think I worked on that. My old I wonder job, why but, they would. Yeah. Why would they do familiar. that? Um, yeah, it is interesting. You don't get the tax on the school system. No one's going to live there with kids. Oh, uh, uh, interesting. Because hmm. you got to be out during huh. that time. Now, you can have kids and live there and homeschool it. But you have huh. to be out January 1st to huh. uh, interesting. April. Hmm. Um, now, it, you know, it, it's not architecturally significant, but mm -hmm. they're all hardy plank sided yep. and grounds are taken care of. It's a great place for people who are retiring, but don't want to be only around retired people. Right. Right. You right. know, because mm -hmm. a lot of people will rent them out for just weekend houses or yep. investment like that. So mm -hmm. there's people coming and going, and then there's people that are permanent, and then there's people who are visiting kids right if you've ever been in a 55 plus community it's yeah. a weird stagnant like, yeah right oh. and i think yeah aging well you have to be part of a community yeah. i mean right. nobody right. wants isolation and uh, yeah. like you were saying any any age group or demographic it's better to yeah. mix everybody mix it together. up yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure my next question what are you using for uh heating cooling water heating that kind of stuff what sure efficiency is built in yeah so uh right now we're gonna be using heat pumps uh for our heating and ac we're going to start by uh, working with the local uh, installer because, um, you know, it's actually a little more complicated to do in-home, excuse me, in-factory heat pump installations just as far as the licensure because you're dealing with refrigerants, which are a little more dangerous with the, you know, emissions and stuff like that. So, so it's still a thing that when they deliver it to the site, uh, HVAC guys? Uh, well, we're likely to have them do it in, the, in our shop. They'll probably come into our shop for the week or whatever it is and run their lines, get everything set up. And then just, just the condenser unit has to go outside once it gets to this uh, job site. So that's our at least current uh, trajectory with uh, heat pumps. I think ideally we want to train our guys to know how to do it ourselves because, you know, the more we can do in-house, the better. Um, and as far as uh, water heating, we're looking at uh, electric on-demand water heaters. So these are going to be all electric, so zero fossil fuels. So the, even the ranges are electric ranges. Uh, we're going to have a heat pump dryer. Uh, washer combo because it's a small space mm -hmm. so we're doing our best to make sure these homes are you know all electric uh you know with solar ready yeah solar ready exactly um uh i've been chatting with revision energy if you know those guys and hoping to you know partner with them in them in some way shape or form and getting their insight on how to best prepare these things to be say solar ready car charger ready so you can have all the you know kind of uh, more modern amenities of you know electrifying your car and your home so um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Seems like if, if townships or cities, whatever, whoever decides the codes, uh, could, 
could start to a lot like smaller pieces, but a percentage of your homes could be a much smaller lot size, mm -hmm. limited to like it only gets a 500 or 800. Right. Like, right. Yeah. You yeah. Can't build a massive thing here, but if right. you want to build, if you want to have a small piece of land that's more affordable mm -hmm. and put a small mm. home on it, yeah. Then you're, you know. But then it's a good idea. Like a certain amount of land to not being built on in a way. That's kind of like what yeah. they've done in Cape Cod. Sure. Sure. Preserve. Yeah. Where they they got to pack all these homes in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they dedicated all this land to not be built on. Right. And they brought a huge tax base to yeah. the town. Yeah. But did not bring a huge tax burden to the school. So right. All right. All these things that work together. That's interesting. To yeah. To make a viable business model that people are buying those things. Like yeah. It's interesting yeah. you mentioned that there's this uh, development in Scarborough. I live right near Scarborough. Um, it's kind of off Route 1. And uh, it's a lot of like really nicely designed, relatively new, I think the past five, 10 years homes. You would think each one was designed by an architect because they got like nice details and dormers or whatever. And I remember driving through there with my wife uh, a couple years back. And we were potentially going to move or whatever. but um, And the lots were so small. I think some some towns and cities these days are doing exactly what you said and like rethinking about like an ordinance and like why can't we have like smaller than the standard minimum lot size and put more houses on it and it felt like you know a denser community for sure but like it worked and they were like some of the houses were like 10 feet apart and, and it didn't right feel up on offensive. the road and yeah, front yeah it was super cute it was like its own little town yeah. within a town yeah and they had a park in the back i was like this is amazing it's so just good planning it's good planning yeah mm -hmm. like we don't need like minimum lot size of half an acre or whatever you can get away with like Little, little postage stamp. My right. property is 60 by 100. It was back in the 40s it was developed. So back then they weren't so worried about like minimum lot size. Mine won't meet a minimum lot size now, but it works for us. We have a house, an apartment, a backyard, a, play, a little play set. It's perfect for us, you know? Yeah. So yeah. the big challenge, I mean, I would love to challenge the municipalities of Maine to really rethink their ordinances. Think critically, yeah. Because yeah. they are very, very limiting. And, right. you know, I think a lot of towns structure their ordinances because they see change and it scares them and they want right. to limit change or limit growth or try to manage it, but it's not really, the zoning ordinances often aren't written as planning tools to manage the mm -hmm, growth. They're written mm -hmm. to restrict. prohibit <laughs> yeah, and exactly. restrict. And so exactly. I, th I think the biggest hurdle we have, I you know, applaud LD 2003, but I think the municipalities have an opportunity to re revisit this and right. look at it in the eyes of creating more housing mm -hmm. and how to create that flexibility because right. uh, it you know really is still going to be a challenge even with this law in place I mean, if, if there was a somehow statewide reform where if there was a graduated system of like within a town center you know to really densify yeah. where densify, is that a word? yeah 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 to densify you know if you took downtown Biddeford and with concentric circles as it went out your lot sizes need to get bigger into the rural sure area. Yeah, yeah, yeah but like within a mile you say like we can do like an eight acre or whatever mm -hmm. right you know, here's the building side you know and it seems like that could trigger a real building boom but if you did it right it could be a high quality high efficiency like you know really let's let's turn this over and try and find the best way to make housing very affordable for people yet not have to embody all this like we've got five acres right right because right. i mean if if i'm thinking about living how i want to live without kids i don't want a lot of land right, right. or a huge house right yeah, yeah. for the person who feels the maintenance of the land that we own mm -hmm. it's a huge amount of stress on me right you know, right like, oh, I, need I gotta to mow that and those trim those and yeah. those homes are gonna kill my kids and yeah right gonna, yeah, yeah, it totally, is totally. To think like, all right, moving out of the raising kids home now to like a prefab pod. <laughs> right. Not to worry about much. Home, right, you know? right. That uh, that's all very exciting stuff. I hope. So when's this legislation supposed to go? Through? July of this year. Yeah. And does it address zoning issues in townships at all, or is what is the main push that it offers us, of, like some opportunity to change things? I think in a nut, it says that any property entitled to a single family home under zoning has the right to an ADU. Mm -hmm. And statewide. Yes. Ooh. And I think that some of the complexities are going to come into, you know, like, for instance, a waterfront community that mm -hmm. has shoreland zoning. Mm -hmm. I think shoreland zoning is allowed to still prohibit it mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's some there's some layers in the municipal ordinances that if the municipalities don't look at this and address it it's not going to have as big of an impact as it's intended to mm -hmm. um, I think I was reading also that uh, 
on, on certain parcels within like a city limit where there's actual infrastructure there, like sewer and water, mm-hmm. where before you can only build a single family home on a lot. They're now saying that you can build upwards of like a quadruplex, I want to say I read, where you could build a four family if it's smartly done and obviously meets all the setbacks and stuff like that. So it's in essence, it could be like four very small homes like stacked together and to just help densify, you know, and it makes mm-hmm. so much sense. Cause like why well, build a 4,000 square foot house? You could build four 1,000 square foot, whatever, smaller homes, you know, and really help with the, solve the problem, right? For people who are develop, developer minded, mm-hmm. it is a huge, huge, if you watch yeah. like um, smartest guys in the room that's about to be Oh, sure. Collapse, okay, yeah, yeah. When policies like this change, you, you guys aren't in the That's not, <laughs> that's <laughs> not my link here. Yeah, but, yeah. They would just hire people to look at the codes mm-hmm. to see how they could use it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Exploit it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. But this is like uh, the doors are opening up to like, as a developer, I can work in these boundaries and be profitable. Mm-hmm. You can't go beyond here and it doesn't make any sense. Right. Now these things are going to open up like, oh, you're telling me a single lot in downtown Bitterford now has the potential of four income properties mm-hmm. rather than one. Or you know, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that's a that's a it's pretty big. It's it could be big. it could be hugely impactful if right. every single single family house lot could suddenly have another unit. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. I think right. that would be huge for us because then we don't have to think about the road situation. Right. right. You just put a house in the backyard and you're good. Yeah. That's right. Because it's it's not another dwelling unit. It's an right. accessory use. Right. An accessory dwelling unit. So you shouldn't right. have to look at it as two houses. Right. Right. <laughs> well, and, what about? Um, and in a, do you know if it has to be physically attached to the house? In some it instances, depends. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the lo- depends the on the town. Um, yeah. yeah, I know that like out west in uh, you know California and uh, Oregon, they've been at this for now I like, think over a decade. The ADUs have been big over there and caught on, and they have, they call them granny flats. I want to say, but they've gotten to the point of you know reworking their ordinances to the point where you can what typically setbacks for your property are so many feet from the property line you have to come in. That's where you can build no closer, right in the side yard. South Portland, as an example, is six feet. The backyard's like 25, 30 feet. In like LA, they've like reduced the setbacks for ADUs to be like four feet from your neighbor's fence. So you can like literally tuck this thing like in the corner, have like the, you know, fenestration and glazing face into the yard. And then they're, you know, doing a great job of making it like that much more attainable to, you know, put and, this thing. And that's exactly the kind of thing municipalities could be looking at. Right, exactly. It's, it's loosening up loosening the those setbacks criteria, yeah. to create the room. Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I know in South Portland too, I think South Portland's arguably ahead of the curve in that they've had the ADU written in an ordinance because they're, you know, they're a city versus like a, you know, rural town, but they've just recently uh, taken away, I believe the requirement, you have to have two parking spaces for another dwelling unit. You don't need any parking spaces now because I got that, that almost was an issue for me at my house where I had arguably a four car wide driveway, but it was like just shy of what the code said it needed to be width wise. Luckily, the code enforcement guy was like, man, you're like six inches off. Because like, I'm like, do I need to build like a wider driveway just to me? He's like, you're fine. You can fit four cars. But now it's, you don't need to have any parking spaces for an ADU because mm. a lot of folks don't own a car. They have a bike. They Uber commute Special. to work or whatever, yeah. right? So yeah. yeah, they're becoming smarter about how to make it that much more attainable and reasonable to do and mm. lift, move as many hurdles out of the way as possible because it's just going to help, right? I wonder if on some, in, in some sense, if the increased housing costs will encourage us to densify and think more creatively about and, and reform kind of our zoning mm-hmm. and our approach to things. Because, you know, people would tack two by four from one building to the other. And just be like, These are the same house. <laughs> right. You know? yeah. yeah. And and I've had to think about a lot. I've had, I considered at one point building a train track and creating two lots. Mm-hmm. Um, Yep. Yeah. Yep. To move the house yeah. ah. from one lot to the other, so it was a temporary home. Yeah. Interesting. Like, these are all the creative right. like. <laughs> How can we make this work? We yeah. Don't let you actually utilize it when it's completely able to. But that's not what they're there for. They're there to protect the codes. Right. They, they're, they're not interested in changing them. Right. Or giving you a pass. It's just like, dude, this is my job. Right. You're not meeting it. Move right. On. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's it's really encouraging to see this. I know. Something will happen in it that will be a bad result, but that always happens. Sure. Any advance mm-hmm. of technology or change in policy. There's some fault in it. Yeah. That we'll have to solve, but that's, we know that. Mm-hmm. Right? It's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Progress. This is, you know, it, this sounds really good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially for someone like me who's been dealing with this kind of for over the last decade mm. to figure out how to, because I want to, I want to invest in my own 
home as a means of financial return mm-hmm. right. because it's not something the bottom can all of a sudden drop out of right. my own land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't really have money in the stock market, but if I had an ADU, right. I know someone's always going to need a place to live. That's right. have a market value that I'll be able to get. Exactly. That's right. And then your, your overall value of your property goes up because of it. You now yeah. have a two family basically. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity. We're really excited about it. Definitely, yeah. Well, that's really exciting stuff. Um, is, is there anything else, like uh, questions or anything that you guys have had other people ask that, that are good questions that I'm not figuring out here? Hmm. Uh, not that I can think of. I feel like we've talked quite a bit about the backstory and yeah, and I'm trying to think. Like site, delivery methods. Yep. Uh, the, the heating, cooling, mm-hmm, methods, mm-hmm. materials, uh, the design flexibility, and everything else at this stage, and then more models as time progresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, when, I, I guess when do the first ones go out? You think? Oh, that's uh, we're going to start production, and hopefully, the next few weeks for our first 500 square foot mm-hmm. unit. So, do you already have safe. orders for that? Uh, we have some folks interested for sure. Yeah, which we're is kind of holding off until we get through um, the modular licensing approval. Right. So they they watch you build the, the first whole one. thing basically in the shop, um, and then you get your license after. So. Right. Yeah. The inspector, the inspector, modular inspector flies yeah. out to our shop yeah, and so like to watches get a, our guys build everything. To, and to get a license to build as a modular builder in Maine, okay. you have to hire a third-party inspector. And ironically, none of them or are in Maine. in Maine. Yeah, they're in Pennsylvania, <laughs> they're, Florida. It's so we have to pull well, high people. I mean, it's so easy well, to enter this market. Right? Uh, yeah, right. That's yeah. true. <laughs> That's they can sleep true. outside. That's a good point. So they <laughs> will have to come up and inspect the home. And only after we build the first one can we officially say we're modular. Yeah, so yeah. we yeah. have um, a waiting list right now of people who have uh, reached out to us and are in the queue, but we are waiting to, you know, c- create contracts for that mm-hmm. moment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So within a few weeks, we'll build this unit, get approval, and then we'll be off and running. the races. Yeah. And the, the, the timeline from, yes, I want to walk through the door, What what uh, what's the timeline on that? I'd say a lot of it depends, as Danielle mentioned, on the kind of the backlog, right? Because yeah. it's kind of going to be a first come, first serve for clients where we now have, I don't know, a handful of folks already in the queue, 10, a dozen more that have seen a website, talk to us at the screen show and are like, I'm interested. How can I get involved? So right. we've got a running list of folks. Um, so that'll kind of play into it for sure as far as like first come, first serve. But, um, but those will be delivered this year and then into next spring. But then right. we, you know, someone calls us today, they could have a unit by next year for right. sure. Right. Yeah, in their property. Yeah. So. But yeah, I'm, I'm always intrigued by these things because for one, they have a huge marketability just in media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, online publications and print publications are all over this kind of stuff. So. And most of it's not New England, you know, a ton right. in it's California, a lot West, in the Europe. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. it is exciting to be doing it in New England. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, right. we're sticking to Maine for now, but you never know. We might branch out. That's right. I went to college in Tennessee for a little while where we actually, we were, we were there in December and there, there was a big train derailment yep. right there near my parents' house. Wow. My son was over the moon. It like no one was hurt, but <laughs> right, he was yeah. able to go and walk around yeah. and he was a big train kid. Nice. Um, but there's a, there's a tiny house manufacturer just a mile from Oh, there. nice. Yeah. And my dad knew someone that worked there, so he got us in where they gave us a tour. It's really interesting to see they essentially build modular, mm-hmm. but they have a whole bay that's just the iron works, essentially the foundation mm-hmm. is transported on that stays with it, and then they move it to the next yep. bay for framing. Yep. And they move it to the next bay yep. for exterior mm-hmm. and the last bay for finishing and selection. Yep, yep, yep. The door. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're in Tennessee. They're building specifically tiny homes for, like, resorts that put a bunch of these out. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Or just individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they're they're in a only four-bay facility right now. Yep. They're moving to, like, 100,000 square feet. Yep. Nice. That yeah. seems to be the number I've seen at shops we've visited, about yeah. 100,000 square feet. Yeah. We're much smaller than that to start because yeah, we're small starting. homes. But, yeah, yeah we hope mm-hmm. to grow at some point. Cool. Well, um, in the future, if you want to do more media just like another podcast like yeah. no cost you just like come and take a tour of your facility once it's up and oh, running that'd be fun. cool yeah that'd be super fun to just come yeah that'd be sweet that'd be great. what your process is that you're willing to share yeah you know, and everything else that'd be super fun to it see. would be that yeah. sounds awesome just get a tour so nice hit us back for that because i i love stuff like that seeing the system set up for business and yeah and then the the what do you call it 
not the not the philanthropic side of it, but the ecology side of yeah. it being built in to a financial capitalistic system at yeah. the same time yeah. and the real world codes and getting people to work and it all actually working is just such a tower of Pisa potential. That I've been yeah. Te- yeah, teetering on for the past year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah obviously you guys have intelligent people on it that really capable of we do, yeah. We have a great team, for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. great. We're excited. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, what are the... Is there a specific website that people should go to? I would say just knickerbockergroup.com. Yeah, and you can find Prefab Pods yeah. from there. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's the name of it. Yeah. yeah. All right, Daniel Betts and Julian... Jalbert. <laughs> <laughs> Julian That's right. Thank you for coming down to Bitterford to talk to us about this. It's yeah. uh, really exciting stuff. Um, looking forward to seeing it in... The upcoming issue of Main Home Design that is in the shelves soon. Thank you so much for coming out. Great. Thank Thanks you. for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us.